Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Vintage Motocross q and I'm your host, Joe Abadi. Thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you, Jordan, Chelsea, and Susie for helping me put the show together. Let's get down to the starting line, and I'll tell you about what you're going to see tonight on the show. Starting line is, of course, brought to you by Motion Pro for all your tools, specialized cables, and controls. Visit Motion Pro online. In the next time, try this segment. We're going to be taking a look at something from our friend Roy Vandeveer, who follows up with something we talked about a few weeks ago when it comes to sealing your exhaust pipes. In the Moto Showcase tonight, look at a Boltaco 250 Frontera that I restored for a customer. It's a really great looking bike. You'll see what we did to it, how it looks today. And here's the problem segment. We've got a great way to clean those rubber fork boots for your bikes and a few other things. It's a great little tip. I've been using it for years. I'm going to tell you all about it. In the What's It Worth segment, a 1974 Honda CR2, uh, I'm sorry, CR125 was recently sold, a mostly original bike. We're going to give you an opportunity to guess how much this bike sold for coming up a little bit in the show. Fritz Gunther comes in this week with another video. Really great for you, Mako guys. A great tune-up tip. Well, I don't want to tell you too much. You'll see. It's coming up a little bit later on in the show in the expansion chamber. Don't forget, if you're watching the show on Facebook or on YouTube, please share it. Tell some of your friends you're watching Vintage Motocross Q&A, where we give away prizes and we do all sorts of neat stuff. If you're watching on YouTube, please comment AMSOIL. There will be a random share giveaway winner later on in the show. So be sure to comment AMSOIL if you're watching on YouTube. And speaking of YouTube, our channel is growing. I really appreciate everyone who has joined so far. If you would subscribe, you'll get a little alert just like this. Tells you when we're live on YouTube and you can watch it on the big screen. And speaking of watching it live on the big screen, here's how all the experts are watching the show now. They're watching on the big screen TV in HD, watching from YouTube while they sit comfortably on their couch with their phone. They can put comments in on the show, watching on the big screen TV, commenting on the phone. That's the way the pros are doing it. You can do it that way too. Vintage Motocross Q&A, one of the biggest points and the greatest segments that I enjoy doing for this show is the here's the problem segment where you send in your questions or comments and we discuss it on the show and also the Moto Showcase. Now, this week in the Moto Showcase, I happen to be putting up a bike that I restored. I would love to feature your bikes. We've done it many, many times in the past, but I need to remind you guys uh, probably at least twice a week. So if you'd like us to feature your bike here on the show, please contact me, inbox me. I'd love to have it. It doesn't have to be a show bike. It could just be your race bike, a bike that's special to you. It could be a mini motocrosser, whatever you might have. I'd love to feature it here on the show. And keep those questions and comments coming in too. It's a big part of the show. And the here's the problem segment. I love to do it. And I'd like to hear from you a little bit more often. So whenever you get an opportunity, inbox me. I'd love to hear from you. I want to thank our sponsors, Emotion Pro, Vinco, Full Circle Racing, Racer X, Preston Petty Products, Northwest Mako CZ, Amsoil, and Sunrise Vapor Blasting. Here's a segment next time. Try this. I told you a little bit about Roy Vanderveer making a video for us, and uh, let's hear what Roy has to say. It's about keeping those pipes sealed, uh, especially at your cylinder where that exhaust flame is. Jordan, let's roll the tape. Hello, everybody at VMX Q&A. Roy here. And the other week, I saw Joe do a nice presentation on how to use high temperature RTV sealant to help uh, seal up some leaky exhaust header pipes, stuff like this. Uh, great stuff. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of different designs out there. Uh, right off the top of my head, I know four or five different ways that <clears throat> exhaust pipes should be sealed up. And the one that I want to talk about here today is what we see right here, where there's an inner flange and an outer flange. This is real common on some older Yamahas, a whole bunch of Suzukis, 
and I believe Mako motorcycles. And something that has seemed to just fall off the radar uh, for a lot of people is there's a packing string. It used to be called asbestos string. Uh, now it's made out of something else, but it's the same thing. It's a high temperature string that's coated, and you simply get some of this and you tuck it into the exhaust flange like so. And it's nice to have a cylinder right here on the table with us. And with that, it provides your header pipe a cushion and a seal to help keep that pressure wave inside the pipe where it can do the most good. Uh, there is no acceptable amount of leakage around your header pipe where it connects to the cylinder. <clears throat> if you want to pick some up, the good folks at Yamaha still sell it. There's the part number. I think it retails for about five bucks per length. You'll wrap it around two or three times, put your pipe on, and maybe every five or six races you'll have to redo it. So go seal up your pipe and get out there. Roy Vandiver with a great tip, and the next time try this segment, which is sponsored by Vinco. Keep the ride going. Vinco. In the Moto Showcase tonight, which is sponsored by Preston Petty Products, we'll be telling you a little bit more about Preston Petty Products a little bit later in the show. But right now in the Moto Showcase, we have a nice Voltaco Frontera 250 that is owned by Bill McGee. Bill McGee asked me to restore this bike for him, and we did that, and I think we did a great job, too. This is a Model 180 250 Frontera that Bill actually uses uh, for a little weekend riding around town. Because he wanted to do that, we did some things with this bike that uh, would be required. In other words, the Preston Petty tail light, the Preston Petty headlight. We did put a new speedometer on the bike. It was treated just like any other restoration that we do, where all the hardware was replated, clear zinc, the way it should be. The spokes were replaced. The aluminum was polished on the cases, and Spanish aluminum polishes up absolutely beautifully, as you could see in that hub, that rear hub on that bike. There's the odometer we installed on it. The bike came out absolutely fantastic for a little bit of easier starting. Bill wanted to go with the Makuni carburetor, so we included a Makuni carburetor on this uh, particular engine. A lot of the work for that engine was done by Lynn Mobley at the time. Um, everything worked on the bike, the lights, and the bike ran flawlessly. Bill loves to use it around town. There's a great shot of the front hub. Nice little details were put into this bike, and it came out absolutely beautifully. We did put Works Performance shocks on it as well. And uh, as you can see, the bike turned out really, really nicely. If you'd like to see more before and after pictures of this bike, go over to Joe Abadi Cycle Therapy on Facebook. There's about 100 or so pictures there of this beautiful Boltaco 250 Frontier. And once again, if you want to have your bike featured here on Vintage Motocross Q&A, inbox me. I'd love to have your bike on the show. We'll give away some nice prizes to people who do send in their bikes. But for this week, there it is, the Model 180 Boltaco 250 Frontier. I hope you enjoyed that. Preston Petty products, whether it's number plates, lighting, fenders, plastic kits, and you saw all that beautiful plastic and lighting stuff on that Boltaco. No matter what it is, you can get that from Preston Petty products, including grips, t-shirts, and hats. Be sure to visit them online at PrestonPettyProducts.com. They're also, of course, on Facebook and on Instagram. Thank you, Paul Standard, for all the help you give us here at Vintage Motocross Q&A. We're going to be having some specials coming up from Preston Petty products in the very near future, too. But right now, let's get down to the Here's the Problem segment, which is sponsored by Motion Pro. Jordan, what's the first question we have tonight? Terry A. Brown, can you explain the rationale in high-priced vintage restorations? I restore bikes, I list them according to my expense, not including my labor, and I have a difficult time selling them. It makes me wonder there, Terry, are you having problems selling them because you're so emotionally attached to them after the job is done? Have you thought about that? Well, let me not get too uh, deep into the psychological end of this. Let's get right down to what I think maybe some of the problems may be when it comes to the rationale of the price and the high price of vintage bikes. Every bike seems to go through a spell. For a while there, you had your 81 Mako 490s that were going for high teens, $18,000, $19,000. They quieted down. Now there seems to be a big rush on CZs. A lot of people are buying CZs right now. Also, I'm seeing a lot of uh, renewed interest in Boltacos as well. The thing you have to keep in mind is that on, on any bike you're going to sell, there's, there's three things. 
Number one, you got to have a good description and clear, concise pictures, nothing cluttered. Get some really good pictures of the bike, close-up shots so people could see all the details you put into it, okay? A picture speaks a thousand words. The other thing is you want to have a paper trail of what you spent on the bike. I know a lot of you guys don't want certain people in your household to know how much you spent on that bike. Well, have the little secret shoebox in your garage with all your receipts in it. Why is that important? Because when you go to sell that bike, you're going to be able to tell the, the, the prospective buyer how much you have invested in the bike. And if your bike is done beautifully and perfectly and it's really nice and you're asking a fair price, you can then tell them, look, if you want to duplicate this bike, you're going to have to spend at least this much to do it. So this is what I have invested in the bike. You've earned a return on that investment, okay? Another thing that's important is, and you didn't really mention it, Terry. Um, I think maybe you did. You said something about a little taco. Um, what bike you've restored and are going to sell makes a difference in the market. As I just said a moment ago, there's a sudden interest in CZs again. Harley Davidson 250 MXs seem to be climbing every month. No disrespect intended, and I'm a Yamaha guy. But if you're just restoring, let's say an MX 250, a 74 or a 175, or a bike that really isn't high on the list of, of, of desirable bikes, you're probably not gonna get a return on it. So you wanna do a bike that's really, really desirable if you can. And you should include something for your labor. If you're doing a quality job and you've done the plating, the spokes, the rims, you've got the correct tires, and it's as close to a restoration as possible, then you should be getting a return on that. Okay? Here's a bike as a good example. It's 1975 Kawasaki KX400 that I restored. The bill for this bike by the time parts, labor, and outside services were finished was over $9,000. Shortly after I completed this bike, it sold for over $12,000. Now, I don't really know what the owner had into it as far as the purchase of the bike. I don't know, maybe a couple thousand bucks, maybe not even. I don't know. But he was into it for 9000 a little bit more after the restoration was done, and he sold the bike for 12000 It's a desirable bike. There's not a whole lot of KX400s out there. It's a great-looking bike. But it depends on a lot of things. And as far as the rationale goes, it's kind of a fickle market at times. We really don't know what's happening with some bikes, why they're quiet, and why other ones suddenly seem to be growing. I think that late 1980s, early 1990s market is going to come on strong in the next year. I've been telling people to buy those bikes all along if you can get them at the right price. I think there's going to be a big surge in that market uh, maybe a year from now. So nobody knows what's the rationale. Do a good job, get the money, have a paper trail, take good, clear, concise pictures, nothing cluttered, and uh, you hope for the best. It's a bit of a crapshoot at times, but... There's uh, no real way to explain it. I appreciate the question, Terry. Jeff Hill, Joe, I love your show and I share it every chance I get. I really appreciate that, Jeff. And for all the other people that share the show too, thank you all so very much. Can you tell me the best way to get Honda red or KX green fork boots clean? I can. It's very simple. It's something you can go down to your local hardware store, even your grocery store and buy. It's called soft scrub and a little scotch Bright pad that comes on the back of the sponge. A lot of people use these in the kitchen. They're good for scouring, and it's really easy to use. You're going to take your fork boot, whether it's the red ones or the green ones, you're going to put it in your sink, run some nice warm water very slowly. You're going to liberally apply some of that soft scrub and then go over every little section. Make sure you get down into those little folds and stuff with that rough side of that sponge and the smooth side too, and you're going to be amazed at how clean those fork boots come out, whether the green ones or they're the red ones for the Honda, even on the black ones too. They can sometimes uh, get a little hard looking. They can get a little mold on them, get a little bit discolored from sitting outside. But warm water with the soft scrub and, uh, you know, rubbing on them, get some nice clean, nice and clean, make them soft again. And the best thing to use after you get them all nice and clean when you put them back on your bike is Mud Slinger by Amsoil. This stuff is great. It really, really puts a nice low sheen finish on the rubber product and also protects it. It's a great way when you go to ride the bike again, to keep mud and stuff off of it as you're riding. Or if it's a show bike, it keeps it looking really nice and fresh for a good long time. Mud Slinger by Amsoil, soft scrub, and a sponge like that, and you're going to return those rubber fork boots into really, really nice condition. I appreciate the question, Jeff. What do we got next, Jordan? Dave Collins, Joe, I follow your Motorcycle Gas Tank Group page on Facebook. I see you use torch to heat aluminum. What type of gas do you use? Yep. Um, over on the vintage, uh, I'm sorry, the motorcycle gas tank Q&A page, I do put a lot of my work there, and a lot of times I do show 
that uh, I use a little torch and it's just like this. And it's nothing more than map gas. Get it from a hardware store. You can buy a tip just like this. Now, a lot of guys will tell you that you can use oxycetylene and that you can put some black soot on the side of the aluminum. And when you heat it up, the soot goes away and it anneals the aluminum and it becomes soft enough and pliable to where you could pry behind it. For guys that are welders and understand metallurgy and heat and aluminum and oxycetylene, they don't need to hear this. For you guys at home who want to try this yourself, I can assure you that map gas will not burn through an aluminum tank like uh, a Honda Elsinore tank and a lot of other aluminum tanks I've done it on as well. You do have to be careful because you want to heat it up a little bit, pull back, just keep it warm, pry away. The, the best thing I can do is tell you this. Try it with the map gas, but maybe go out and buy yourself an aluminum tank that is really beyond repair. Buy it cheap. Maybe you'll find one at a, a swap meet or, or somewhere on eBay, somewhere. Just get one that's cheap and make sure it's aluminum. And then test your skills on that tank with map gas. Make yourself some tools. There's plenty of pictures of the tools that I use on the motorcycle gas tank Q&A page. And uh, give it a shot. If you have any questions, you could always inbox me. I'd be more than happy to tell you how you can repair tanks yourself. Or you could pay me to do it, and it may cost you a couple of bucks more. But anyway, that's what I use, map gas. Give it a shot yourself. We'll take a commercial break. Don't forget to keep sharing the show, whether you're on Facebook. And if you're on YouTube, please share by commenting AMSOIL. We will have a random share giveaway winner a little bit later on in the show. Jordan, let's break to a commercial, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jeff at Motion Pro, showing you our Bead Pro combination tire tools today. Uh, now, these are a very innovative tire tool in that they are multifunctional. They both are great for breaking the bead of your tire as well as spooning the tire on and off the rim. Now, we have two versions. The first is the standard Bead Pro. These are Forge 7075 T6 aluminum in construction, very lightweight for tool pack use. And then we have the Bead Pro FS, the FS standing for Forged Steel Construction. Now, these are great for shop use. They are a little bit longer, so you have more leverage. They're 16 inches long versus 9.8 inches long for the standard versions. Now, the geometry of the tools are about the same between the standard and the FS versions. Um, but as I mentioned, the materials are different and the lengths vary a bit. Um, now they have a nice ergonomic feel in your hand and this cross T feature keeps your hand from slipping as you insert the tool into the bead of the tire. And on the one end, you have this innovative uh, tongue and groove feature, which leverage the tire off of the rim. It easily breaks the bead on both off-road uh, wheels and tires, as well as street applications, even those with large safety beads. Now the opposite end have this nice smooth spoon profile, which easily uh, brings that uh, tire up and over the rim to bring it off and then spoon it back on. Uh, these are affordably priced, so go ahead and pick one up for your tool pack as well as for your shop use. Uh, they're available from your favorite power sports dealer nationwide. Another great item from Motion Pro in the What's It Worth segment tonight. We're going to take a look at a 1974 Honda CR125 that recently sold on eBay. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this bike. It was sold in Minnesota. And uh, before you put your, uh, your guess in for how much it sold for, let me read a little bit about this bike, and then you can do that. This is the highly sought-after vintage motocross racing motorcycle. has been part of my personal collection for over 25 years, says the seller. I'm downsizing at this time. I want to go to a new, new home. I'm the third owner. It's a low-hour, mostly original machines. It runs and idles beautifully. Great for display of the track. It's got new fork seals, fresh fork oil, OEM grips, new brake and clutch levers and covers, new drive chain, new air filter, new spark plug. Everything is greased and lubed. It's ready to go. Bike has zero hours runtime since the above items were installed or replaced. It's also got the original Brinstone 275 21 on the front, the 350 18 on the rear, original exhaust pipe and silencer. There is one small dent in the exhaust pipe. It's got the original chrome handlebars. They're straight. The original, rent, the original front fender and mud flap. They are not broken or cracked. There is some paint peeling on it, though. 
Original rear fender, it's got, th it's got the production racer decal on it. Original fuel tank, there is some rust on the interior. It is good for display. It does have the original seat cover as well. The bike also comes with a brand new Clark manufacturing plastic tank. It does have a reproduction front number plate and reproduction side number plates on the bike. I try to describe it as clearly as I can and as concisely and honestly, it's a 47 year old race machine. It is not a museum piece. This bike recently sold in Minnesota on eBay. And are all the guesses in of how much this bike sold for? $4,050, $4,050 recently. And uh, I thought that was, I thought it was a pretty good deal because everything is there. The only thing I could see on it, I think that was, uh, a little difficult to replace or find would be the ignition cover. But other than that, I don't think this bike is as quite as original as it sounded in the description. The frame looks a little too fresh for me to be original. I think it was repainted, but a lot of the other stuff is original on the bike. And what really, really impressed me was it had the original tires. So they were a little worn, but still, it's got the right Kickstarter on it with that little bend on it for 1974. It did have the original tires, which is a huge, huge plus when you're doing a restoration, if you can find original rubber for the bike. So at 4,050 bucks, I think somebody's got a really pretty good deal there uh, with the exception of the ignition cover. The pipe is there, the pickle's there. It's got the original shocks. And as I mentioned a couple of times already, it's got the original tires. So 4,050, I thought that was a pretty fair deal. 4,050 bucks from Minnesota. That's what it was worth to someone. That bike was not on the Vintage Motocross Buyers and Sellers Price Guys page, but if you are looking to sell a bike and you're wondering what your bike may be worth, or you're looking to purchase a bike and you want to know if it's a fair deal, go post it at the Vintage Motocross Buyers and Sellers Price Guide page. The page has been up there for over five years now. There are 16,000 members and everyone treats everyone else with a lot of respect there. There are over... There are thousands of pictures of bikes that have sold and the price and the description. There's also some results from auctions there as well over the past years. And we're going to probably be having some Meekum motorcycle auction results there uh, coming up at the beginning of May. So keep your eyes peeled on the page for some auction results. But in the meantime, if you want to know what your bike is worth, post it there at the Vintage Motocross Buyers and Sellers Price Guide page, and uh, you'll hear some good, honest, respectful answers. Sorry, something popped up on my monitor here. In the expansion chamber tonight, which is brought to you by Full Circle Racing. While I was speaking about Full Circle Racing, Tom McAllister, been there, got the t-shirt, Full Circle Racing. We'll be talking about a special that they have a little bit later on in the show. But right now, we're going to be taking a look at another video sent in to us by Fritz Gunther. We're going to pop it into the old VCR. See what Fritz has to say. All right, today we're going to look at doing a uh, squish band check and the squish band part of your cylinder head is this part right here, very important to performance, uh, compression ratio, uh, has a lot to do with the fuel you can use or have to use and we've got a 490 Mako here today and, and typically the, the squish band on these you can set them up from about 40 thousandths at the narrow end to about 60 thousandths at the top end and uh, as you go from 60 thousandths which is probably uh, safe to use for pump gas towards the 40 thousandths you're going to have to start using race fuel and I like to uh, for guys that use race fuel I like to set them up at 50 thousandths on the big bore Mako so everything should be cleaned up the head the piston dome uh, I start out with 62 thousandths just lead wire solder uh, is all it is and you bend a piece like that and make note of your head gasket thickness because that will determine how you're going to change the squish band on the Makos they can head gaskets are typically about 60 thousandths thick uh, this one happens to be 42 thousandths I've seen some of them that are down 30 and even 20 thousandths so different size thicknesses thickness head gaskets are available but uh, the most common seems to be right around 60,000. So uh, you put your lead wire like this, bolt down your cylinder head, and then slowly rotate 
clockwise, or excuse me, direction of rotation. And once you get the head on, you'll bring it up and you'll feel it get snug and you roll it just past that. And then we'll show you what the results are. Okay, we've got uh, our lead wire on top of the piston installed, head gasket, thickness noted, heads bolted down. And now what we're going to do is we're going to bring the direction of rotation. We'll come forward. Okay, now you can feel we've hit that solder wire. You just want to go just past it, just like that. You'll maybe rock back and forth a few times. Okay. Now what we're going to do is take the head off and we'll measure the wire. Here we've got our lead solder wire and you can see right uh, on the edges it's been pinched down just a little bit. It's flattened out. And we'll, next thing we do is we just take our calipers, measure that, probably three, four places along each side, and we'll get an average. So we've got, as you can see it here, we've got just about 57,000 squish band, which uh, for pump gas, I think we'll be okay. It's a great little tip from Fritz Gunther. And when you're out there searching for those gaskets, don't forget Northwest Mako CZ. Give Alan Brown a call, whether you're looking for gaskets or whatever you're looking for, for your Mako or CZ. Uh, they're a sponsor of the show and a big help to us. And I want to thank them right now. We'll have a little something on Northwest Mako CZ a little bit later on in the show as well. But thank you, Fritz Gunther. Full Circle Racing, as I told you just a little while ago, they do have a special, and it continues, powder coating your hubs. They will clean, disassemble, blast, mask, and powder coat them for just 50 bucks a hub. For $10 more, they'll gladly do the brake plate as well. Upon request, you can get other colors other than matte and gloss black for just $20. It's a one-time charge. So you can get your hubs up there to Tom McAllister, get them all bead blasted and powder coated. Tom can also supply you with spokes, nipples, and rims. Okay, so whether it's for vintage or modern, you should go visit Tom McAllister at Full Circle Racing Limited. Thank you, Tom. And thanks again for the T-shirt. In the product spotlight tonight, we're going to take a look at something from Vinco. It's a Suzuki RM125 top end. It is available for the 77 and 78. It is 54 and a half millimeters. It comes five millimeters over as well. It's 145.95, and it's a 10% discount over what the individual items will cost you. These complete tap end kits come with everything you need to get your rebuild done easily and cost effective. All components are made with modern materials and manufacturing techniques to ensure as good or better than OEM fitment and performance. The Suzuki RM12577-78 top end piston kit in 54.5 millimeter, that's plus five millimeters over. And as I mentioned, that's a 10% discount uh, off buying the parts individually. Comes with the piston, the head gasket, the base gasket, the intake gasket, the exhaust gasket, and the wrist pin bearings. Vinco, keep the ride going. Visit them online and, of course, on Facebook. I want to thank Curtis Leverton and uh, Jay Clark, everybody over at Vinco for all they do for us here at the show. Northwest Mako CZ, I just mentioned him a moment ago, and Alan Brown's got a great little special going on this week, $89.95, brake anchor, chain tensioner combination for your CZ. This is a great item. If you have a CZ, you know you need this, okay? Alan Brown's got them, $89.95. Alan's got some other products coming up, too, in the very near future. In fact, they, they might be on the website at this point. If not, they're going to be up in the next week or so. He's got some Mako Kickstarter shafts coming in, some ship shafts, and a lot of other things coming up there as well. And they're all made in the USA. So if you get a chance, whether it's your Mako or CZ, get over to Northwest Mako CZ, visit them online and on Facebook. And they've got a lot of other parts over there, too, that you can use. Carburation systems, handlebars, things that are a little more universal for your Suzuki, Honda, Kawasaki guys as well. Northwest Mako CZ, they're now in Pennsylvania. Alan Brown, thank you for all you do for us here at Vintage Motocross Q&A. Sunrise Vapor Blasting, you heard me talk about this last week, doing a great job up there. Mark Farrister, numbers 209-531-7312. Mark has got some great before and after pictures here of some work that he's been doing. And in the very near future, next week, probably, we're going to have a nice video from Sunrise Vapor Blasting 
on the things that they're doing. Look at these cases for this, uh, I think it's an H1. Also, the way aluminum parts come out, like this bolt for a Makuni carburetor, nothing cleans aluminum, makes it look more natural and gets into the pores of it, much like vapor blasting. So get a hold of Mark Farrister. He's got a great page on Facebook as well, Sunrise Vapor Blasting. He's up here in Northern California. Tell him you saw it here on the show and uh, we'll talk about maybe putting a little special together. We'll try that. Give Mark a call and check out his page and look for the video coming up on next week's show. Amsoil. Last week, we did a little interview with Russell Waters on Vintage Motocross Radio. We'll hear from him in just a little while, but right now, got a great special going on. Everything in this photo, you can get for just $46.99. It's a $75 retail value. Now you get everything in here, plus you're automatically given 25% off list on everything across the board at Amsoil for the next six months as a preferred customer. The PayPal is there, Amsoil Plus at AOL.com. All you need to do is include your mailing address, your phone number, and your email, and you're gonna get all this stuff that I'm showing right here. One, two, three, four, five, six different items plus a funnel for $46.95. This is really a great combination package too for anybody that's into off-road riding. The mud slinger, the chain lube, the metal protector, the miracle wash, and uh, we've even got some uh, firearm lubricant because a lot of you guys, uh, I'm sure you have firearms. So we're throwing this into the package as well. $46.99 retails for $75. Get it while it's hot. Great little special from Amsoil. Thank you, Russell Waters. We're going to take a commercial break. Don't forget to keep sharing the show, whether you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube. Comment Amsoil if you're on YouTube. When we get back, we're going to have this week's winner of the Amsoil Random Share Giveaway. Jordan, let's see what that commercial looks like. We'll be right back. Classic and vintage dirt bikes are more than a hobby. It's not just about the ride. It's about the work that goes in. The work that keeps you connected to the ride. It's about bringing the bike back to life. And doing it with your own hands. It's about the adrenaline and adventure. And when it comes to putting all the pieces together, only Vinco knows the bikes and parts the way you do. Vinco, keep the ride going. I did promise you a random share giveaway winner tonight, and that random share giveaway winner is Mason Boyd. Mason Boyd, please contact us with your mailing address. We're going to get you a nice little gift, compliments of Amsoil. Mason Boyd is the random share giveaway winner tonight. This week in motocross history, sponsored by Racer X. Racer X, one of the finest publications on your newsstand now, also available online. Big news, today's Donnie Hansen's birthday. Not just this week in MX history, but today. My good friend Donnie Hansen turns 62 years old. He was born in 1959. It's a great picture of him and his beautiful wife, Rebecca. Donnie, as you know, was a 1982 AMA 250cc motocross and supercross champion, as well as one of the four heroes of Team USA in 1981, first American team of Laporte, Hanson, O'Mara, and Chuck Sun. To everyone, the trophy and motocross donations, all four were induct inducted into the AMA Motorcycle Hall of Fame. Donnie is also the father, of course, of Josh Hanson, the longtime 125 lights and 250 rider. I want to wish Donnie Hanson a very, very happy birthday, and uh, I hope to see you soon, whole shot. Have a happy. In 1973, it was one year before there was a standalone AMA Supercross Championship. There was no Supercross Championship in Daytona in 1973. The Daytona race was considered an AMA motocross outdoor race. There were two classes, 250 and 500. The winner of the 250 class that day was Husqvarna's Bobby Grossi. The winner of the 500 class was Pierre Kosmacher. In winning that race, Cosmockers gave Yamaha their first ever 500cc national win. That was also on March 10th, 1973. Pierre and Bobby Grossi taking it home at Daytona. 
1976, the Houston Astrodome was home the second round of the AMA Supercars Championship. And Jimmy Weiner was the winner that night on his Kawasaki after uh, being with Yamaha for a year. This was a race that went on actually two different nights. And Jimmy won over Ken Howerton and Tony DiStefano. As I said, it was a two race format, two different nights. Weiner went seven and one, one and two. Howerton went two and three, three and five. DiStefano went one and two, 14 and one. The jammer was the big winner of the night. But one of the really interesting things that I found out when I was doing a little research on this article was that there were nine brands of motorcycles in the race that weekend. Kawasaki, Suzuki, Yamaha, Husqvarna, Honda, Taco, Mako, Can-Am, and Gary Jones on an MX Ice Low. Nine different brands in one race. Those were the days, huh? Congratulations to uh, Jimmy Weiner for winning that race and for the uh, Jimmy Weiner training facility, which is still going strong down there in North Carolina. What do we got up next, Jordan? Oh, we've got the announcements. One of my favorite parts of the show. And I'll be happy to tell you about some things that are going on. What do we got up first, Jordan? Mark Hildebrand. A very good friend of mine for almost 20 years. Of course, he is the owner of Nightmare Racing. If you don't know about this by now, it's been on Facebook. Mark Hildebrand is uh, in serious condition with a bad case of COVID. He is in the hospital. He is on a respirator. He is stable right now, um, but he does need our prayers and does need our help. He's got a long fight ahead of him. I've been in touch with Ashlyn and Lynn, his daughter and wife. They both contracted COVID as well. They're doing a lot better than Mark. They are home but they uh, did suffer some uh, respiratory problems and some pneumonia-like conditions. But right now, Mark is in a hospital in serious condition in St. Louis. Um, so if you have ordered any plastic from Nightmare over the past couple of weeks, it may be a little bit of a time before you say it. Please keep Mark Hildebrand in your prayers uh, as we have been doing here. So, um, In fact, we've got a little special message right now from someone um, directly to Mark Hildebrand. Um, Let's just roll this and you'll see what I'm talking about. Hey, Mark, Alice Cooper here. Well, um, Lori wanted me to uh, get in touch with you and to uh, just say, look, encouragement, man, all the way. Uh, you're, you're tougher than, than COVID, and I think you're going to make it. So we're just all, you know, we're, you, we know you're in Barnes Hospital in St. Louis, and probably nobody can come in and see you because of COVID. But believe me, we're all thinking about you. And uh, I can all I can say is I'm praying for you. And I do some pretty mean prayers. All right? Mark, I'll talk to you when you get out of that machine. All right? Okay, bye. Great personal message from Alice Cooper, of course. And as Alice said, let's keep uh, Mark in the prayers. And... Um, I have been uh, updating on my Facebook page when I hear things from Ashland each day. So let's be patient with Mark and uh, good thoughts coming his way. Finish Motocross Radio last week, my guest was Amsoil's Russell Waters. Russell, of course, is my representative for the Amsoil sponsorship that we have here on the show. Um, the show is every Sunday at 11 a.m. Let's listen to some of the things that Russell had to say about Amsoil. Uh, on last week's show. What exactly is synthetic oil? How is it different from conventional oil? Is it manufactured? What, what wow. makes what makes a, a synthetic oil synthetic? What wow. Is, what is that? That's a deep question, yes. I think everybody knows synthetic oils really outperform conventional oils today. Mm -hmm. um, but you might not understand why. So the difference begins at the molecular level. I mean, the uh, a molecule of synthetic oil is perfectly round. It's made in a laboratory. So if you can describe it, if you look on a microscope at a molecule for synthetic oil, it looks like a marble. It's perfectly round. And if you look at a conventional oil molecule, it looks like a piece of popcorn. It's, you know, rough edges. It's not perfectly round and it's, you know, it's, it leaves spots if they come together. There's holes in between them. Conventional oil is distilled, and it still has contaminants in it. They don't get all the contaminants out of oil, conventional oil, that is. Okay. So AMS oil perfected no contaminants in the oil. So it's it solves a lot of problems.
great time speaking to Russell Waters. So much uh, to learn about synthetic oils and a lot of other things. So if you get a moment, go over to Vintage Motocross Radio and you'll be able to listen to my interview with Russell Waters. My guest in the coming weeks will be announced very soon. I have a couple of people that I've been speaking with and uh, we will be telling you in um, eh, before Sunday. Before Sunday, you'll know who our, who our next guest is. So thank you, Russell Waters. And uh, thank you, Emzo, for being a sponsor of the show. Vintage Motocross Radio is also available on uh, your podcast. Whatever podcast you listen to, whether it's Spotify, Apple, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Overcast, whatever it may be, you can listen to all of our episodes of Vintage Motocross Radio wherever you go. And you don't have to be on Facebook or on YouTube to do it. Just go on to your podcast channel. You'll find us there, Vintage Motocross Radio. White Lightning, that big race is coming up March 12th, 13th, and 14th. That's, uh, wow, that's right around the corner. So, got a big uh, enduro race down there, cross-country trials and motocross. That's coming up in Buffalo, South Carolina, March 12th, 13th, and 14th, sponsored by Haggerty, Race Tech, and, of course, Motion Pro. It is an ARMA event, so check on the ARMA website or go over to the White Lightning website, and you'll find out more about that race and what's going on there. I know my buddy Al Roof will be there. Ah, Pacific Northwest Vintage Motocross is at Woodland. That is coming up um, March 20th. That's a couple of weeks away. There is a race fee, 30 bucks for members, $40 for non-members, $15. There's a there's a, a gate fee there for just 15 bucks. Jordan Woodworth will be there. I'm giving everyone fair warning. Jordan Woodworth will be there with his Mako, ripping it up at Woodland on March 20th. Sad news out of Sweden last Saturday, Bink Aberg has passed away. He was one of the top riders in motocross Grand Prix World Championships during the late 60s and the early 70s. In 68, he was part of the Swedish team that won the Trophy the Nations. He won the FIM 500cc World Championship two times, 1969 and 1970, while he was aboard a Husqvarna. Aberg was a member of three Victoria Swedish teams at the the Nations in 70, 71, and 74. In 74, 75, and 76, he rode for Boltaco Factory uh, in the 500cc class. In 77, he competed in a highly modified four-stroke Yamaha XT500, built in collaboration with the former world champions, Torsten Hallman and Sten London. Aberg rode that bike to a victory in the first moto of the 77 Luxembourg Grand Prix and ended the season ranked ninth in the final world championship standing. Ben Aberg, gone at just 76 years old, two-time world champion. Vintage Motocross Q&A t-shirts and hoodies are still available for just $19.99 for the t-shirts. Follow the description in the show, and you will uh, find out how much those hoodies are as well. I don't know how much longer we will be running these, but get them while you can. T-shirts and hoodies in white or gray. Vintage Motocross Q&A sponsorship opportunities are still available. Everyone's seeing the results, whether it's uh, Sunrise Vapor Blasting, Vinco, Motion Pro, Northwest Mako, CZ, Preston, Petty Products, Full Circle Racing, and Amsoil. Everybody's getting a piece of the pie. We're hitting over 20,000 people a week, sometimes 100,000 people a month. It's a great way to get your product out there. You get a lot of eyeballs on it through Facebook and through YouTube, where, we're, where we have our channel there. And uh, I also mention these products when I do my Sunday show, Vintage Motocross Radio. So if you'd like to become a sponsor of the show, get in touch with me, send me a message in the inbox. I'll get you a sponsorship proposal package and we'll put something together that fits your budget. Vintage Motocross Q&A, sponsorship opportunities. Get it while you can. I want to thank everyone for watching Vintage Motocross Q&A tonight. Jordan, Chelsea, Susie, for putting the show together. Congratulations once again to Mason Boyd, the Random Share Giveaway winner. And don't forget to tune in to Vintage Motocross Radio on Sunday and watch all of our shows on YouTube. Every one of them. From the, uh, all, of our, all of our Vintage Motocross Q&A shows, all of our interview shows, they're all available on YouTube. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And uh, we'll see you next time on Vintage Motocross q and I'll get him now. Let's see if he's ready. Gino! Gino! Gino, come on, boys!